Hi everyone, and welcome back. In our last lesson, we introduced the notion of a Taylor series. The idea there was that a function can be approximated by its Taylor polynomials, and in many situations, the approximation gets better and better and better when more terms are used. With this in mind, it might be tempting to claim that the function is equal to an infinite sum of terms from its Taylor polynomials. We refer to such a sum as a Taylor series. The word series here suggests that infinitely many terms are used. Now for some functions like e to the x, sine x, and cos x, the Taylor series really will match the value of the function at all inputs x. But for other functions, if we're not very careful, we can run into some weird and counterintuitive situations. At the end of the last lesson, for instance, we ran into the equation 1 half equals 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, and so on, which feels like it should be wrong, and it is. But at the moment, we don't have the tools to describe why it's wrong. With that said, the purpose of this video is to formalize what we mean by an infinite sum, or as mathematicians might say, an infinite series. That is, we're going to define what it should mean to add infinitely many terms, a0, a1, a2, and so on, and have the sum be a finite quantity, which is very counterintuitive. To build up some intuition, let's check out some examples together. Here I've included four examples of infinite series to help us build some intuition. In some examples, it may feel reasonable that the series is equal to a finite quantity, but in other examples, this may seem completely outrageous. Let's start with example one. Here we're considering the series one plus one plus one plus one and so on. Should this infinite sum be equal to a finite quantity? No, of course not. Your intuition says no, but why not? If you had to put it into words, you'd probably say something like, the sum keeps on growing. It never stops, it never stabilizes. More formally, what you probably mean by this is that when we add more and more terms to our sum, our sum is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger without bound, right? If we add just the first two terms, we get two. If we add the first three terms, we get three. If we add the first four terms, we get four. And the trend here is that these partial sums, the sums that we get by adding just finitely many terms, these partial sums are running off to infinity. So there's no way this infinite sum will be a finite number. Moving on, let's check out the series in example two. Here we have the sum from n equals zero to infinity of minus one to the n. That's one minus one plus one minus one and so on. Hmm, I wonder, should this infinite sum be equal to a finite quantity? Well, here it might be a little less obvious, but perhaps we can use the same line of reasoning that we used in example one. If we add the first two terms in our series, we get a value of zero. If we add the first three terms, we get a value of one. If we add the first four terms, we get a value of zero again, and so on. You can see that when we add more and more terms, our partial sums are always gonna alternate between zero and one. Okay, now in the first example, the partial sums kept growing, 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 and the series was not equal to a finite quantity. Here, the partial sums aren't growing, growing, growing. They're bounded. But still, they never settle on one particular finite number. So I think in this example as well, it makes sense to say that this series is not equal to a single finite quantity. What about example three? Here, we're adding up terms of the form three times 10 to the minus n, where n goes from one to infinity. This looks like it could be more complicated, but it's really not. Think about the numbers that you're adding up in terms of their decimal expansion. 0 0.3, 0 0.03, 0 0.003, and so on. That 10 to the minus n term is gonna shift the decimal one place to the left every time. We ask our question once again, is this infinite sum equal to a finite quantity? Well, you know the drill. We're gonna see what happens when we add finitely many terms. If we add just the first two terms, we get 0 0.33. If we add the first three terms, we get 0 0.333. If we add the first four terms, we get 0 0.3333. I bet you can guess what happens when we add the first n terms. We're just gonna have a string of n threes. Ah, now in this case, it seems like our partial sums really are approaching something that we can write down. They're getting closer and closer 
to 0.3 repeating, which is exactly what you get when you write out the decimal expansion of one third. So maybe it's believable that this crazy infinite sum is really just one third. I think our last example might be the most interesting. Here we're adding up powers of one half, one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth and so on. Now is this equal to a finite quantity? Hmm, I can tell that my terms are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So when I add more terms, the sum is growing less quickly, but still it does continue to grow. Is it growing like an example one where it just blows up to infinity? Or is it growing like an example three where it ends up approaching some finite quantity? To figure this out, we're gonna look at our partial sums. If we add just the first two terms, we get a value of three quarters. If we add the first three terms, we get a value of seven eighths. If we add the first four terms, we get a value of 15 sixteenths. If you continue this process, you'll see that these partial sums are always less than one, but you can basically get as close to one as you want by adding more and more terms to the sum. So maybe it's believable that the sum of the terms in this infinite series is actually equal to one. It turns out that it is, and we'll soon see a mathematically rigorous reason for why this is the case. But for now, you can think about this in terms of the following cute analogy. Suppose that you have a cake, one whole cake. You give half the cake to your friend. Of the remaining half, you give a quarter to another friend. Of the remaining quarter, you give an eighth to another friend. Of the remaining eighth, you give a sixteenth to another friend, and so on. You give smaller and smaller pieces of cake to your infinitely many friends. Well, if you add up those infinitely many pieces of cake, you still end up with one whole cake. Pretty cool, huh? Now, hopefully we've had a chance to build some intuition through these examples. From what we've observed, it seems like we can decide whether or not one of these infinite series will approach a finite value by looking at the series partial sums, the sums that we get by adding just two terms, three terms, four terms, or in general, n terms at a time. So let's go ahead and write down the formal definition of a partial sum, and then we'll write down the formal definition of what it means for a series to converge. Hopefully the examples on the last slide have given you a sense of what we mean by a partial sum of an infinite series. But we're gonna write down the formal definition here just so we have it on the record. To start, let's suppose we have an infinite sequence of terms that we're trying to add, a0, a1, a2, and so on. For each non-negative integer n, we can define the nth partial sum to be the sum of the terms in our sequence up to a n. So s n, which is the notation we usually use to denote the nth partial sum, is given by a0 plus a1 all the way up to a n. You can see below I've actually written out the first few partial sums for a general sequence a k. S0 is A0, S1 is A0 plus A1, S2 is A0 plus A1 plus A2, and so on. I've also written out the first few partial sums from one of our concrete examples on the last slide. This is from the fourth example, where AK is 1 over 2 to the K. Here, K starts from 1, so we don't actually have a zeroth partial sum. Our first is S1, which is 1 half. Our second is S2, which is 3 quarters. Our third is S3, which is 7 eighths. And here's the expression for the nth partial sum, Sn. If you follow the trend here, you may be able to see that Sn is really 2 to the n minus 1 divided by 2 to the n. Okay, here's the big takeaway from this lesson. The definition of what it means for an infinite series to be equal to a finite value. Suppose that I hand you some infinite sequence, a0, a1, a2, and so on, that I want to add up in an infinite series. If it's the case that the partial sums Sn approach some finite real number S, that is, the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn is equal to S, then we'll say that S is equal to the value of this infinite series, and we'll say that the infinite series converges to S. If instead this sequence of partial sums, S0, S1, S2, and so on, tends to plus or minus infinity, or this limit doesn't even exist, like in example two a couple slides ago, 
then we'll simply say that this series diverges. Let's wrap up this video by applying our brand new definition to one of our previous examples. The sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the k. Earlier in this lesson, we used intuition to argue that the sum of this series could be 1. Is this consistent with what our new definition is telling us? The definition says that we can understand the convergence of our series by looking at the limit of its partial sums Sn. On the last slide, we found that the nth partial sum is given by Sn equals 2 to the n minus 1 divided by 2 to the n, which we could rewrite as 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n. Now when n tends to infinity, this term is going to tend to 0, pulling the entire expression to 1. Ah, but if our partial sums are approaching a value of 1, then according to this definition, 1 is the sum of our series. So this series is convergent and it has a value of 1, just as we suspected. Let's check out another example together in the next video.